Well, it's great to uh, sing those old hymns and uh, be reminded of our, our rock. That was great to be able to sing those songs. We're going to be continuing on in our series on clear thinking. And we've been looking at uh, changing the way we, our mind, changing the way we think about a lot of different things, like talking about our problems, about relationships, about how we, how we see change, uh, about sex. And so uh, we're talking about this based upon Romans 12, verse 2. And uh, why don't we say it out loud together, okay? So don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so we're talking about lining ourselves up with God and allowing Him to change the way we think. And allowing God, we're placing ourselves in a, in a position of surrender and of submission to God so that he now invades us and we become more and more like him. That's what it means. We're placing ourselves in that position intentionally. By the way, choosing to follow Jesus is a decision. And I know that sounds like a very obvious statement. Uh, it's not, you know, many people, they, they, when they become a Christian, they accept the fact that God has forgiven them of their sins, they've accepted Jesus into their heart, but they remain stuck in that position because they've never actually made the decision to intentionally place themselves in a position where they are following Jesus. We don't drift into discipleship. We don't accidentally become mature in, in Christ. It, it actually requires intentionality, that we are actually deciding to place ourselves in a position where we are following Jesus, where we are surrendering to him, where we are listening and obeying to the God who has created us, who loves us and desires the best for us. So this is why it's important that we change the way we think because we are aligning ourselves with him. We are becoming more and more Christ-like. And today we're going to be talking about what does it mean to think clearly about stress. Now, stress is something that we all can relate to. Uh, I don't think there's anyone here that hasn't experienced what we call stress. It is one of these um, uh, unavoidable byproducts of life. And there's all kinds of things that, that happen, circumstances, life events that occur that, that you know, we have this reaction to, that this stress that happens, whether it's financial stress and feeling the, the pinch every month after month, or maybe financial ruin, or maybe there's a conflict or difficulty at, at, in your workplace where you're, you're about to lose your job, or you have lo lost your job, or you're dissatisfied with your job. Maybe it's a health issue where there's a chronic issue, there's pain or an injury, um, and, or maybe there's a loss of life, a loved one has passed away. Uh, maybe there's conflict in our relationships, You've gone through a separation or a divorce, or there's, you have rebellious teenagers, you have uh, arguments with your parents, and the list goes on and on. There are even events that aren't necessarily good or bad. You have situations where you might be late for an appointment that causes, that makes you feel stressful, forgetting to pick up something, missing a deadline, rush hour traffic, uh, teaching your teenager how to drive. Uh, that can be pretty stressful. But even positive circumstances can cause stress, such as having a baby. We've had lots of babies recently. Moving into a new home, getting a promotion at work, or listening to a sermon on sex. All of those things can produce a lot of stress. So the list is obviously endless. And anything that you can think of that brings challenge to your life, of course, you can think about that this is going to be stressful. But this is what I want to point out in all of this. The stress is not something that is coming from the outside. Stress is something that comes from the inside. Stress is, is something that we often blame on our circumstances or our situations and say, this is causing me stress. When in reality is actually how we are thinking about it. It is our response to it, is our reaction to it. It is coming from the inside. So let me help you think about it this way. You can have two people that have the exact same circumstances, and one of them reacts with extreme stress, and the other one reacts uh, not, stressed, not stressed out at all. So, uh, you know, for example, somebody sent out a, a boss or, or the professor sends an email 
out to these individuals and they say, I want to speak to you privately at the end of the day. And one person reacts, oh no, this is terrible. I know I've done something wrong and so I'm going to lose my job. Whereas the other person says, this is great. They really liked my presentation. I'm going to get a promotion. And so you have two people with the exact same circumstances and they reacted very differently. Now the truth is both of them could be deluded. Both of them could have completely wrong thoughts about the situation, but it doesn't matter. The point is, how we think about situations has a great deal of an impact upon our stress and what we are going through. It will determine your ability to deal with stress. Psychologist William James says this, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. Stress really is a combination of all kinds of emotions such as worry, guilt, fear, bitterness, anger, tension, anxiety, all those things combined together, but it's all based upon how we think about it. How we think. A way of thinking. And so that's why the Bible says that we, we should be thinking clearly about stress. So 2 Timothy 4 verse 5 says, You should keep a clear mind in every situation. A clear mind. That's what we're talking about, clear thinking. And that's why I said earlier in Romans 12 too, it said don't conform to the behaviors and customs of this world because the world doesn't think clearly about stress. It doesn't think clearly about anything. And so we need to have the mind of Christ to think clearly about this, lining up our thinking with God. And when we do that, our stress is reduced. Amen to that. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else want to chip in? <laughs> when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle Paul had an, an incredible life with all kinds of circumstances that were overwhelming. And in 2 Corinthians, we're going to be focusing on a second letter to the church at Corinth, where he talks a lot about the stresses that he was going through. So here's a, a long list. I know it's a, a lot of words on the slide here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and this is what Paul says. He says, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped more times uh, without number, faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced dangers from my own people, the Jews as well as from the Gentiles. I face danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I face dangers from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and I've often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And then besides all of this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all of the churches. Now, would you have stress if you were Paul? Now, Paul, not only does it say this, but he was actually very vulnerable at one point in this letter, way back in the first chapter. This is Paul saying, this is, this is so overwhelming, I almost quit. He says this, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. So here, Paul is in a vulnerable position, and he's telling us that I have endured so many trials, so many difficulties, and I can't think of anybody other than Jesus who has endured more trials and more pressure than Paul. And he's feeling overwhelmed. He's feeling crushed. And, that, and yet, Paul was able to endure. In fact, it says in 2 Timothy 4.7, just before he went to be martyred, Paul says this to his colleague, Timothy. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. How is that possible that Paul was able to endure all of these circumstances, to go through all of these trials in his life? How can we be able to overcome the stresses that we endure, the circumstances that we are in? How can we think clearly about stress so that we too can finish the race. Well, let me give you three principles. The first one is this. Trust God's sufficient grace. 
So Paul is, is openly admitting that he was crushed, that he was overwhelmed to the point of death. And maybe you have felt that way, that you have felt that you have just been overwhelmed with all kinds of circumstances and you're ready to quit, you're ready to give up, you're ready to run away, you're ready to give up on your marriage, give up on church, give up on your relationships, whatever it may be. Paul knew that level of stress. And yet he says this, picking up in verse 9 again, he says, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Uh, this is interesting because the result of his circumstances that were overwhelming, he, the result was he stopped relying on himself and started to rely upon only God. And the reason why that is God is the one who raises others from the dead. And he thought he was going to die, so he turned his attention to God. So what does that mean? And Paul actually fleshes this a little bit more in chapter 12. So we've just read chapter 11 of that long list of all the circumstances. Then here in chapter 12, starting at verse 7, he says this. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. So this is in addition to all the things that he's already said in chapter 11. Now he's saying there's one more thing that I was given, and that is a thorn in the flesh sent from a messenger of Satan. Now there's a lot of discussion about what that thorn in the flesh was. Obviously it wasn't a literal thorn in his flesh. There was something that was causing him a great, uh, a great pain and sorrow in his life. Uh, people have suggested maybe it was blindness or speech impediment or depression or his wife. or We just simply do not know what that thorn in the flesh was. But we do know that it was serious. We do know that it was serious because it was a messenger sent from Satan. And uh, Satan isn't going to send something mild. So then picking up verse 8. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And what did God's response was? What was his response? Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And Paul says, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul went through excruciating circumstances beyond what one could imagine, and he begged God, please take this away from me. And God says, no. Isn't that remarkable? I'm not going to take that circumstance away. I'm not going to take that situation from you, but I'm going to do something better, Paul. I'm going to give you my grace. I'm going to give you my power. I'm going to give you my ability to face any hardship, any circumstance that you are going to encounter. It is through the power of Christ that Paul was able to endure. Paul talks about this again in chapter 4. He says, We ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on from every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not given to despair. We are hunted, but we are not abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be found in our bodies." So how was Paul able to endure these circumstances? As humans, he says that we are like jars of clay that are fragile. You drop a jar of clay, even from a low distance, it's going to shatter. But there is a treasure inside. And he describes what that treasure is. The treasure is actually the life of Jesus. It is actually dwelling inside of him. It is empowering him. It is giving him the grace that he needs. It is giving him the ability to endure. It is God himself who is filling us and empowering us. That is the ability why Paul was able to endure. 
And that leads me to the second principle, and that is this. That we are to rely on the life-giving words of God. So if we really want to understand what Paul is saying about the life of Jesus indwelling him, we have to actually go to the life of Jesus and look at him and see what he does. And so we have this example right after Jesus was baptized as he was starting into his ministry here on earth. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and became very hungry. And it was at that moment that the devil took his opportunity to tempt Jesus at his most vulnerable state. And the devil comes to him in Matthew 4. He says this, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, I just made some bread yesterday. And you know what it smells like when bread is fresh? It's amazing. And so I can see how this would be what an amazing temptation. I couldn't wait to take a taste of my bread. How much more after 40 days? And Jesus replied, and he, re, he, he, he refers back to Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, which is an important part in scriptures. And he says, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so what Jesus is telling us here is that human beings, need, they have two fuels that they need. Two fuels. One fuel is our food that we eat. We need food in order for us to live. We need regular meals and and liquids to help us live. But even people who eat three meals a day, most of us here are eating well enough. Even those who are eating well still experience anxiety and depression and despair. And so Jesus says, that food is not enough. There's something else that you need. And he says, what you need is every word that comes from the mouth of God. So how do, we, how do we understand the Word of God? Do you see that as a source of life? Do you see that as your fuel that you cannot live without? This is what God is saying, that you cannot live except for the words of God. Jesus says in John chapter 6, The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. And I know this is true for me. That when I'm experiencing stress and anxiety in my life, and I still do experience those things, and, and I think to myself, okay, why am I feeling this way outside of just the simple circumstances that I'm in? And often the reason why is because I have forsaken the Word of God, that I have not invested the time and energy that I needed to allow God's Word to fill me and to restore me, to renew my strength. I'm going on my own strength. I'm going on my own abilities. And so I know that that's one of the reasons why I too experience stress and uh, anxiety in my life. I want you to listen to the many benefits of dwelling on the Word of God. Here we have many things. Anxiety gives way to peace. In Philippians 4, verse 6, 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, I, uh, I just recently read about Amazon that actually keeps track of all the things that you read. So if you ever buy uh, an ebook from Amazon, and you're reading it on your Kindle or your smart device, it knows not only what you're reading, but it actually keeps track of when you're highlighting something. So you highlight a sentence, it's kind of shocking, right? You highlight a sentence, I highlight a paragraph, it actually keeps track of that. So if you have a Kindle version or an ebook of the Bible and you highlight a verse, it knows which verse you've highlighted. So it recently uh, talked about that. It shared what those results were. Guess what the most highlighted verse in the Bible was? It wasn't John 3.16. It wasn't Psalm 23. It was this, Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Because people are experiencing worry and anxiety in their life, and God's word brings peace of mind. Secondly, sadness gives way to joy. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. Fear gives way to security. 
Psalm 16, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad, and I rejoice. Failure gives way to success in Joshua 1.8. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it daily, day and night, so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Anguish gives way to answered prayer, John 15.7. But if you remain in me, my words remain in you. You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. I mean, we could keep on going. There's so many verses that will talk about how God's word fills us with life. And here are just some words here. Peace, joy, security, success, answered prayer. This is life. This is what God gives to us in his word. Have you discovered that? Yes. Amen. And are you following along in the, in the Bible reading plan, immersing yourself in God's word and experiencing his life, that which brings us peace, joy, love, security, success, answers to prayer. The third principle is this, and that is to move from independence to dependence. Moving from Dependence upon myself to a dependence upon God. Moving from self-reliance to God-reliance. The reason why we need to do that is because my resources are limited. I only have so many abilities. I only have so much intellect. I only have so, many, so much energy. I have only so much awareness. I need something outside of myself. To going from independence to dependence. Now, it's no surprise for us to talk about the fact that in our, our world, in our Western civilization, there is so much emphasis on individuality and upon independence, uh, you know, following your own heart and be the you that you need to be and all kinds of junk like that. And I didn't realize how far it actually went until I read this story about Laura Messi. She was a woman who married herself. Now, Laura is an Italian fitness uh, trainer, and she was dating somebody for 10 years, and they were planning on getting married, but before the marriage actually happened, he walked out on her. And uh, she was desperate to get married before she turned 40, and she never found her Prince Charming before she turned 40, so she decided to marry herself. And she invited the brides, she had bridesmaids and she had 70 guests and there was a three layer cake with only a bride on top of it instead of a groom. And she said, I do, in front of all these people to herself. And she says, I firmly believe that each of us must first of all love ourselves, that you can have a fairy tale story even without the prince. And apparently this is a thing. I didn't know this. But this is a thing. People are actually getting married to themselves. It's actually got a name. It's called polygamy. Instead of polygamy, it's polygamy. And it's just saying that we affirms one value and it leads to a happier life. Now, this has just gotten silly. Well, it's true that the Bible encourages us to love ourselves. We can't expect true happiness when we are trusting in ourselves alone. This is why we have been talking so much in the last few weeks about life groups and how important it is for us to be involved in a community of believers where you are experiencing uh, the community of accountability and encouragement and prayer from others. But even more than that, God has invited us to depend upon him, that our dependence must be rooted in who he is and that we have actually already a Prince Charming in our story he invites us in to move from this independence into a dependence and a deeper trust with him because he has wooed us into this relationship with him. Now there's a fascinating piece of, of uh, story in the Old Testament that talks about people who have accidentally killed someone. Uh, back in the Old Testament there was uh, kind of an aggressive form of a justice system. It was a tribal form of, of crime and punishment. So if somebody died in your family, the family would come together and they would have this meeting and they would discuss things and they would say, okay, you are going to be our blood avenger. 
And what that means is that you, this person was going to represent the family and they were going to seek out, track and hunt down the person that killed their loved one and justice would happen by killing that person. And then after that happened, they would come back together as a family, they would celebrate, have a party because justice has been served. However, there wasn't a provision early on for somebody who was accidentally kill, that accidentally killed somebody. There's an unintentional homicide. Uh, so what do you do then? Let's say somebody's ox trampled somebody and accidentally killed somebody, or, or there might have been some accident in which this didn't meant to be happened, but this person died as a result. And so in the Old Testament, in the Deuteronomy and Numbers and Joshua, we see that God steps into the situation and he addresses the problem by establishing cities of refuge. And Joshua says this, it says, Tell the, in Joshua, it says this, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. So God established these six cities, cities of refuge, where a person could run to if they were in a position where they accidentally killed somebody. And then if they arrived at that city before the blood avenger tracked them down, hunted them, and found them, and killed them, if they made it to the city of refuge, and they were in the city gates, and they were safe. And then they would have a, a trial, a fair trial. And if they were innocent, they were let go. And if they were found guilty, then the blood avenger had his way with them. But I want you to notice something. That God, what did God do in the midst of this situation, this very difficult set of circumstances? God provided a place for people to run to, a place of shelter, a place of refuge, a place where a fair trial could take place. And God named this place, these places cities of refuge. The idea of these hiding places and these shelters comes out of the very heart of who God is. It is bound up in the nature and the character of God to provide safety and refuge for people who are feeling oppressed and hunted down. It is the heart of God to provide safety and refuge for people who are under great pressure and weathered and wearing down. It is the heart of God to provide safety and refuge for people who are in unimaginable situations and great stress in their life, for them to provide safety and place of rest. There's a great uh, picture in Psalm 91 that God's refuge is available. It says this in verse 4. It says, He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. And the image there is of a mother hen. When there is a mother hen senses any dangers or if there's a predator nearby, the mother hen instinctively would raise both of her wings and the little chicks would come running and then she would close the wings on top, and the chicks would be safe. They would be sheltered. They would have a place of safety and hiding, and they would be okay in that place. Eventually, they would emerge and they would face the scary world again, but there's nothing like being sheltered under the wings. And so, if you are under great stress today, if you are being tracked down or hunted, or if you are feeling the unfriendly forces of, of people and so on, and you can't seem to escape, you need to understand that we have a God, a God of refuge. It is the very heart of God that he provides this. The heart of God that he would provide a safety, place of safety. Just like he provided the cities of refuge, he provides himself. Come under my wings, he says. Rest in me. Come away out of the danger. Renew your strength. And he only asks that you, that you take that step, that you, would, that you would submit to that, that you would... This is actually a bigger step than we might realize. In fact, for many of us, it goes against the grain of ourself. And it is moving from independence to dependence. I'm going to trust in you, God. I'm going to rely upon you. I'm going to place my soul in your very care. I've seen far too many people who have actually run away. Even those people who have, you think that they have gotten to the end of their rope. They've lost so much. And yet they still resist the dependence upon God. 
They're still trying to work it out on their own strength. They're still trying to do it on their own abilities. And they find it too difficult to completely surrender into God's hands. Psalm 91 verse 15, it says, When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. So when you need God's refuge, what do you do? You just simply call upon him. God, I need your help. God, I need your strength. I need your safety. I need you to renew me. I need to be protected. And I submit myself into your hands. You know, Christianity never promised that adversity would be gone. The, the trick behind not with reducing our stress isn't trying to avoid those circumstances or trying to change the circumstances or trying to avoid them altogether. That's not what Christianity has promised. But what God has promised to us is that you can depend upon him. You can trust in him. That God will provide. That his grace is sufficient. That his words will give life. And that we can find refuge under his wings. Let's close in a word of prayer. Some of you this morning may be experiencing a lot of stress in your life. You're worried, you're anxious, you feel the pressure, your circumstances are difficult, too hard to, to bear. So I invite you to listen to the voice of God. Listen to him when he says, I am your shelter, I am your refuge. You can take refuge under my wings. Let's just spend some, just a moment of silence listening and hearing the voice of God saying that to us right now. Thank you, Jesus, for this place of safety and refuge. You may want to pray something like this in your own heart. Dear God, I do feel pressured. I do feel uh, this stress uh, on every side. I, I need your help. I need you to rescue me from the circumstances, the situation that I'm in. So I thank you that you are a shelter, that you are a refuge, that your promises are faithful, and that you will protect me. Father, I pray that you would help me to orient my life so that I would be in a posture of submission to you in every area, that, I would, that my schedule, that my relationships, my activities, all of those things are going to be surrendered to you that I would be involved in a, a, a community of faithful believers that were going to help me grow, to help me trust more in you. That I would spend regular times reading your word and listening to what you have to say to me. And that I would truly know your grace, your life that flows inside of me, that gives me the, the power and the ability to endure every circumstance. And so, God, we submit ourselves into your hands and trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.